Comedians from the World Series of Comedy, Part 1. That's what's coming up on the Art of Bombing, Episode 168. My friend Dan, he's got a podcast, cause all comics need a podcast, and nobody had a podcast called The Art of Bombing, so Dan went out and bought a tape deck, who knows why he bought a tape deck, now cast don't get played on tape decks, but Dan is from the 80s, so hey there all you funny jerks, come talk to Dan about your work, tell him all about your worst times, it's The Art of Bombing. Welcome to a brand new episode of The Art of Bombing. Dan Bublitz Jr. here with you on Tuesday, November 10th, 2020. I am uh, coming at you from my hotel room at the Stratosphere in Las Vegas, Nevada, from the World Series of Comedy. This week I'm going to have uh, several comics from the World Series of Comedy from all across the country on the podcast. I'll be releasing several episodes throughout the week. This is the, the first episode that I'm, I'm releasing from the festival. I do apologize if the audio is bad. Like I said, I am in my hotel room. Uh, when traveling, I don't get to bring all my fancy equipment uh, because I just can't do that. So, uh, with that being said, if there's uh, if you notice the audio is a little different, I do apologize. But what do you do? This is what happens when you mobilize and uh, you do all your recording in a hotel room. It is what it is, but the episodes are going to be great. Today's episode is fantastic. I had a fantastic conversation with a great comedian from, uh, I believe it's Sarasota, Florida. Uh, his name is VN Pamachan, and we had a great conversation. You're going to love it. We talked about uh, quite a few different things. It was a fun conversation. A uh, little longer than the rest of these episodes will be throughout the week. I'm trying to keep them shorter since I'm releasing m several of them throughout the week. So this one's a little longer, but it was a great conversation. Well worth, uh, well worth the listen, that's for sure. Um, I'm going to keep my intro short because I've got to get ready to do some more recording. So if you haven't, make sure you hit the, the, the subscribe button. Make sure you like our social media. You know, Go to artofbombingpod.com, leave us a five-star rating and a nice review and all that business. And uh, yeah, you'll be hearing a lot from me this week. So here's the episode with the end. Enjoy. It's now time for the stand-up soundbite. So I am a doctor in real life. <laughs> this is a true story. Uh, but I'm not sure I actually wanted to be. It's more like I have Asian parents and I don't know what the other options are. <laughs> My parents weren't like, you should go into medicine and help people. My, they were scary. My mom would say stuff like, if you don't get into med school, you have to massage creepy old man. <laughs> So I went to med school because I had nightmares about massaging Gandalf, like seeing what kind of magic would happen. Yeah. <laughs> he has a magic wand. Um, I'm an ear, nose, and throat doctor. It's not as sexy as it sounds. It's weird. I talk to people about snot all day long. <laughs> It wasn't my first choice. I wanted to be a neurosurgeon, but I couldn't. Like, you have to be at the top of the class. And the way it works is, the further down the class you are, the more your job involves leakage. I was in the middle, so I got snot. say anything incriminating <laughs> i have to keep my tourettes under control yeah maybe if, if it's gonna get you in trouble <laughs> tourettes is a disease so if i say something inappropriate and you judge me you're actually the bad person well i'm not gonna judge you i'm just gonna have it documented I, i'm just saying it's discriminatory <laughs> if i say something weird and you hold it against me because it's a disease this is true this is true and you should never victim blame that's right that's what that's what we're learning here in america these days <laughs> no no victim shaming yeah, interesting. Sorry, I gotta... Should I narrate what's happening? <laughs> then I'm adjusting it, the it stuff. It looks like, like Dan my... Bublitz is 
<laughs> stroking his own crotch. Yeah. In, yeah. in case you can't see this and you can't because it's audio, we're in his room. I don't know him. <laughs> and now and now his leg's shaking really, really intense. People, He's getting people real know nervous. I'm here. I just want you to know. I've told at least three people I'm here. <laughs> well, that's good. So that's if good I'm that molested or disappear, they'll know. <laughs> they'll know where Bublitz. to look. <laughs> Dan Bublitz, 6043. That's where the body will be. That's right. Well, no, I'm not going to leave the body in the room. I'm going to have to find another another place to leave you. <laughs> Prop you up at one of the machines down in the lobby. <laughs> well, your fans will know where to find me. <laughs> there we go. There we go. Oh, man. So you just got in today. I got in yesterday. Well. Oh, you got in yesterday. Oh, yeah. okay. Got in late. I uh, walked up and down the strip a little bit. It was cold and barren. It's bizarre. There's yeah. like no people in Las Vegas. I know. It's weird. Like, I got in this morning and uh, just like coming into the airport, you know, you're used to seeing just all the machines going. Like, yeah. You know how they have the, they have, mach- you know, uh, slot machines and stuff at the airport. Yeah. Most of them were like closed off. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's weird. Well, you know, when you walk through a casino, there's always like a hundred people really happy to be in Vegas. Right on a trip, woo! And then yep. there's like one person who's sad. Now it's like it's a casino, and all the happy people aren't there. It's just the sad people at the machine. Yep, the one that looks like they live <laughs> in the casino. Yep, you're you're not wrong. Like the you're broken wrong. person. So if you come to Vegas, it's like 600 machines with 60 people. Yep, all broken. So if you're missing a family member, that's where they yeah. are. Yeah, he's, you're not wrong on that. Not wrong at all. Yeah, it's weird. Everything's like. They're they're somewhat open, but there's a lot of stuff. It seems like they're that that's closed down. Like even at the hotel, we're at the Strat, and like a lot of the the, the Skywalk or whatever it is. Like I was looking at that, a lot of it's closed, 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 yeah. closed. <laughs> well, they have this observation deck, the the the, the top of the Strat. Okay, that's and you're what it is. you're supposed to. It's a rotating thing, and you can see the skyline. Oh, uh, okay. It's called the Sky View or something like that. Okay, yeah, the Sky View. That's and right. I noticed that you can get food from there, takeout, but you can't eat there. Oh, it's a restaurant. It's a too. restaurant, okay. yeah. And so I, I want to know what kind of lunatic decides he's going to go up 500 feet to get a carryout meal. Right? I don't know. That's a it's weird like you thing. can't go on the observation deck. I just want to go really high vertically to get my food. Yeah, I don't, I'm. I'm. I'll pass. <laughs> I don't think they thought that one out when they said, we'll do takeout only. Yeah, no doubt. I think it would have been okay to just shut that one down. That's a long ways to go to get takeout, too. Like, to go, like, because that's a long ways up. (laughs) And I don't think it's probably the selling point, either. No. No. Well, and I imagine for people when they come here, it's just so they can say that they, I mean, they got food there. They can say they ate there. They don't have to go into all the details. (laughs) They can buy a T-shirt now and not feel guilty about it. Exactly. I was in the sky view. (laughs) Leave that part out where where they were in the lobby. No one has to. <laughs> no one calls them out on it. It's like, what was it like? It was high up there. It was a great view. <laughs> it was like it's like the end. You could feel the pressure difference. <laughs> yeah, my ears that, popped. Yeah, that took a while for me. Come when I flew in this morning for my ears to pop back. I was like, oh. Go, walking through the airport, I was having a hard time hearing anything. We, we could do the podcast about that, you know. You probably could. Yeah, yeah I know because you're also a doctor. I just I, found I'm out. an ear, nose, and throat doctor, and I just turned this conversation <laughs> into a whole different podcast. I, this is going to be me selling my business now. We're going <laughs> to give you the phone number for my practice. I'll explain how we fix that problem. Are you you're in uh, Florida, correct? Yeah, I'm in Sarasota, Florida. Okay, how long have you been doing comedy then? Two years. Two years. How do you like that? I love it. Yeah, I, I love it. I would hope. If you're yeah, traveling all over. Yeah. Do you? Is it hard? Do you find it hard because you are a doctor, and that's obviously a busy life. You know, uh, being a doctor can be quite busy. Do you find it hard to balance between trying to do comedy and I then don't. your regular? I don't. Yeah. You know, I, doctors are really good at managing their time, mm-hmm. and I think that's a that's something that. Every every doctor has a hobby. Everybody has a hobby. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And it just happens to be my hobby, and mm-hmm. it fits perfectly into my life because we don't do doctor stuff on Saturday night at 11 o'clock at night. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, I'm off the clock. It's perfect time for me to go do something goofy, you know. Yep. Other doctors would be getting married again for the ninth time <laughs> or, you know, or they're carving a wooden duck in their shed or something yep. like that. I, I mean, you... 
it's just what I choose to do instead of, you know, womanizing or whatever, you know, other doctors do. Yep. So. Oh, oh that's great. That's yeah. This is a great hobby to have. Uh, how's the scene in Florida? Well, Florida's Florida's great because uh, they they're kind of are just pretending COVID doesn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> Florida was the first state to open, and the first club in the country is my home club mm-hmm. to, to reopen. Uh, and so and I go to Laugh in, in Fort Myers, Laugh in Comedy okay. Cafe, and it's you know we're doing. Obviously, it's going to sound bizarre if you're listening in california but we've been doing live shows this whole time like i think since may is when we reopened yeah well there's i think there's been quite a few that actually opened up in may too yeah. you know because i know wise guys opened up around yeah. may and then some of the clubs in minnesota started opening up in june not quite as early as may but i think that the only difference that you would see like most of the venues a couple of venues are have just chosen not to be open mm-hmm. um, um there are self-imposed restrictions yeah you know uh capacity wise and then some of the shows they do they do shows where they say they advertise that they're wearing masks just to get those kind of more timid people out you know to add a level of safety so that that reminds you that there's a pandemic but as far as show schedules it's pretty close to where we were before yeah are they they're doing you said so it's it's more by choice if they do reduce capacity yeah florida's kind of made it (laughs) sort of whatever (laughs) you you can wear a mask or not it's It's your life yolo yeah (laughs) that's yeah florida state motto is now yolo come have a laugh it might be your last laugh (laughs) give me give me freedom or give me death or give me both (laughs) that's funny oh man yeah i I don't know. I know a couple people that live in the Florida area, but I don't remember what area of Florida. I know. Uh, do you know Doug Canny? I know Doug Canny. He lives like right where. I don't know why. You know what? He actually lives on the east coast of Florida. I think. If Doug, you're listening, yeah, you can call I, don't, in not, and I can't remember where. I but just know he's down in Florida. He's in Florida, but we, I've been on a show with Doug, and uh, his home club is actually. It's not where he lives, which. I, I don't understand. It's it's in St. Petersburg. I think Coconuts is his home club. Yeah, which is where I am. But he, I think he lives on the other coast. So, oh really? Oh yeah. wow, that is weird. Drive all it, the way it, to the other it side. It could but... also be my lack of understanding of the situation. Yeah, just well, in case someone is a big fact checker on Doug Candy. You're gonna go look it up. Don't and see. don't yell at me. I have Tourette's, <laughs> and we yeah. don't victim blame on this show. That's funny. Yeah, I met him uh, a lot of years ago. Actually, like ten years ago when yeah. I first started comedy. He was on one of the first, uh, he was doing a tour through here with another comic, and I did like a guest spot on their show. Well, not through Vegas, but where I lived at the time. But uh, And speaking of doing shows, this is the art of bombing, so we're going to get into that, <laughs> the, the, the sad part of this podcast, and I'll let you tell a story uh, about a show where you felt like you bombed or the show just was poor, just didn't go well. Oh, I, I bombed, I legitimately bombed, <laughs> and I deserved every minute of it. Um, so it was, it was fairly early. I want to say I was like eight or nine months into comedy and I had a, 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 a fairly rapid success. Um, you know, I, I, my very first show is still one of my best shows ever. Mm-hmm. I got a lot of laughs, a lot of applause breaks. And then, you know, I, I, I had won an, an open mic contest locally and then i had entered two other local contests and i was in the top three i was second place and third place and so i was i was just like you on know, top of the world i was on top of the world <laughs> i am good at this and so i decide you know i i had worked up to something like eight or nine minutes i wanted to be able to feature so i i, I was i wrote five new minutes you know mm-hmm. and so we go to this club in tampa side splitters uh big club and and their open mics not normally that well attended normally it's 12 people in the audience something like that it's yeah. sunday night typical mic. open mic but it, it was Mostly. this bizarre constellation of of events led to it being 300 people in this club the club was like full wow. for an open mic and i don't wow. know if no other entertainment option was available that night but every comic is jazzed and so am i because i don't know in advance that i'm going to bomb <laughs> and i had not I, I don't think it was 300, but it feels think, like that. Do you think if we knew when we were going to bomb, we'd we'd try we 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 just wouldn't perform that night? If you could, if you could, I, like I don't think you it. could call it a bomb. <laughs> you know, if you knew 
I think you would call it a firework. Yeah, exactly. You know, because then you would you would light it and run away. Yeah, yep. Yeah. But a bomb <laughs> is something that by nature catches you off guard. So by Absolutely. definition, we 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 walk onto it, and it's like an I. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm sure I'm exaggerating the number of people, but the club seats probably 300 people, and it was pretty full. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's just say 250. I go up there with five new minutes and all the the pride in the world that I'm going to show these people. And then this is a club that I haven't performed in, you know. I go up there with five minutes, and two minutes in, the alarm bells go off that I am not doing well. And then it erases my memory. Oh, no. (laughs) Because it's unrehearsed. You know, I had memorized it, but I hadn't really eaten it on stage. Mm -hmm. And at this moment, I'm just like, that emotion creeps into my head and erases my memory. And so the last three minutes, I just forget, you know. So yeah. I actually had to grab my phone, which is sitting on the, the, my, the table, like not where I am, bring it back, open up my notes to remind me where I'm from. And at this point, the audience is cringing. They're like, you could have just stayed off the stage, you know. <laughs> like we, we're, we're, we're good. We had enough. And for whatever reason, I didn't. I just felt like I needed to finish the set. You know, I, I felt like I, I need to own this moment and eat it and learn from it. So I finished the set. But, but it was one of those moments where, like, nobody would make eye contact. You know, yeah, yeah. like there was like a radius of people that like I would walk through and it looked like I was magnetic, like negatively charged <laughs> magnetic. Like there was no one within 20 feet of me in a crowded club, like making eye contact. And, and you know, the, the consolation conversation you have afterwards you know, they're yep. like, good job, man. And and it's, like, painful for them to say. It was, like, 25 yeah, of those. Yeah, they're trying to be really nice, but they're, they, but they, they're but just, like. But it's making like, it worse. Make it, yeah, making it's, it worse. It, and they're like, I don't even want to talk to you right now. I'm afraid <laughs> I'm going to get what you got on me. <laughs> and I remember one of the other guys who had bombed. and but But by the end of it, I had made his bomb a not bomb. You know, like I, <laughs> you made him look I, like I had crushed. erased the memory of him bombing. I mean, that guy talked to me, but in a way where he was like putting his hand on my shoulder and being like, hey, we've all been there. I was like, you were there two minutes before I was there. Jerk. It's like, if anything, you need to be thanking me because they yeah. forgot about you. Thanks all to me. I did was make make a more memorable bomb than you did. My <laughs> bomb was bigger than your bomb is all that was. <laughs> it's like, give me credit where credit's due. <laughs> Wow, that's amazing. It's it's and that I feel like happens a lot to newer comics when they start out really hot, you mm-hmm. know, like you really get it really builds your confidence and your ego right away. So when you have that first bomb, like I imagine it it feels worse than if you just would have bombed. I almost know? quit comedy. Oh wow. Like it was that bad. It, yep. and it, it immediately erased all of the success that I had. had. You know, I, yep. I, I felt naturally gifted. And then I was like, I'm not, I, I've used it all. <laughs> I'm not funny. It ran out. I, it's gone. I've, I've, I've shot my load and now I have to go home. Did you, now I like to talk about how you analyze, how comics analyze sets and try to figure out what went wrong. Did you, do you record your sets? I, and- I do. I record every single set. And this was the only set, it was the, the kind of set that I knew, I remembered what I did and I know not to do any of it ever again. So I didn't have was to watch it. Was it the material or, well, or what? Oh, I guess, w- what did you feel like went wrong with that? Other than I know you were doing untested material, but that's the point because it's an yeah. open mic. Well, that's well, why you, you go you know, to an open mic. You know mic. never to do untested material, like all untested material. Yeah. Even at an open mic, mm-hmm. you're not supposed to go up and do five new minutes. Yep. I, I was brash and arrogant, and, th- and I thought I could get all new material to work. And, and there was nothing setting it up, nothing – you know, it, the material was – all of it still being you, like I was able to salvage it. It yeah, was all absolutely. funny, okay, but it was unrehearsed. I didn't know it cold, um, and it's just being in an environment like that. You know, I didn't do that thing to, to where I convinced the audience that I was funny to begin with. Mm-hmm. I didn't do tested and safe material to say I'm funny, and yeah. then you throw out the the not funny stuff. And see if it sticks. But they, they forgive you because they know you're funny. Yep, and then yep. you go back to being funny again. I just went up there and said, I'm not funny. And I'm going to continue to be not funny <laughs> for for five NFL minutes. You know? <laughs> like, not like regular minutes. Oh, it's no, NFL it's minutes with, with the timeouts and the commercial breaks. And it ends up being really like 25 minutes. Yep. And that's, it's that. funny because I always notice that with comedy, like when you're having a really good set, time just flies. Yeah. You do like... 
25 minutes of crushing feels like five a five-minute set. But when yeah. you're bombing, that's an eternity. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a time distortion because, like, you'll do 25 good minutes and you'll throw one new bit in there. Yeah. And that that four seconds of not laughter feels like it's a minute long. Yo, oh, absolutely. And then you absolutely. start to hurry afterwards. Yeah, that's what I find is when you follow a bad bit, you go too fast. Oh, because absolutely. Because you're trying to make up for lost what you think is lost time. Yeah, I guess I never thought of it like that as far as trying to make up for lost time. But that is a good observation because I know I definitely when I do a joke and it doesn't land, I do catch myself. Then I start rushing. Yeah. It's like I got to get. Before the unfunny sinks in. You don't yeah. Want, you don't want that to like seep in and yeah. take root and grow. Yeah. We don't want to be it. like, get, 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 let me remind you I'm funny. Don't want it lingering. <laughs> yeah. That actually happened to me at the dry bar comedy special. Oh, yeah. yeah where I, uh, because you get 20 to 25 minutes uh-huh. and on the first show. I did almost the full 25 minutes on the second show. I ended up doing like 22, 23 minutes. So it was like way shorter than the first show. And I did all the same jokes, but the yeah. crowd just wasn't responding. Just and so it was like, oh, I got to keep going. Yeah. You know? So it's amazing how that time can fluctuate yeah. when, you, when you hurry through. Yeah, I've had a show where I, I was going to do a 20-minute set, and it ended up being 28 minutes. There was a little bit of crowd work thrown in just because mm-hmm. it was a very, very active audience. But then the, that same material just stretched out so far just because of, you know, laughter and applause. So I, yeah. I enjoyed that. That was good. Yeah, that's that's, how, those are always <laughs> nice. <laughs> that's how it is in my mind now every time. <laughs> so next open mic, I'm going to go do five new minutes. <laughs> just get grounded. Yeah, just so I, you can I've remember gotten, what I've it feels like. I've gotten that good again. <laughs> Just so you can remember what it feels like to be grounded. Because I'm a moron. <laughs> well, I feel like we all are. That's why we do comedy. I, I, I'm doing I'm doing eight new minutes on my show on Wednesday. At a national contest. Eight minutes. New. All new. Oh, why not? Why not? <laughs> it's all COVID jokes, too. Oh, well, gonna you're going to kill then. They're going to love being reminded of that. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, topical humor. I don't know how... How much topical humor, you know, and topical jokes you do. I typically don't do a lot of that stuff. Once in a while I will. But I've noticed with, with like, COVID, people, you got to be real. You got to do it with uh, very gracefully because it's like people are living this and they do not want to be reminded of it. Yeah. I, <laughs> but it's also, yeah. like, it's like a weird elephant in the room. So yeah. it's like you almost have to mention it. You can't escape it. I mm-hmm. think you have to acknowledge it. Yep. It, it, it's the backdrop. It can't be the topic. No one wants to talk about it. But you also can't, you can't be like, you know how we go everywhere all the time and have dinner without masks and smile? Because <laughs> yeah. you don't. You know, can, Then you have to make this setup longer where you're explaining that this is before COVID or maybe yep. someday after COVID. And so that, that becomes like a little thorn in their, in their side. So everything that I have to do, like all the things that have occurred because of COVID, I will tell jokes uh, like as a result of COVID, mm-hmm. like in the context of COVID. But COVID never really the material, yeah. you know, yeah. it's never really the crux of the joke. It's just the backdrop that we're all living in. It's mm-hmm. the scenery in, in which the, the, the play takes place. Um, going back to your question, I don't do a lot of topical. You mm-hmm. know, most of my stuff is anecdotal, uh, um, um, you know, personal experiences. Because I'm really trying to craft an act that I can use for a long time. Yeah. You know, I don't want the COVID stuff to die, and then I have to write jokes about the aliens that come. You know. Oh, yeah. At the end of this year. Yep. That, and then, uh, yeah, when the when the the whole country falls to whatever, whether it's democracy yeah. or or the rectal parasite aliens, whatever. That come, <laughs> yeah. That, that come at the end of this year. <laughs> I, you know, I'm going to write those jokes now, and I'm going to be on the edge. Yeah, people, that's going to be your eight minutes of new jokes. It's going to yeah. be all about aliens, and people are going to be like, Wednesday what night. are they talking about? What is he talking about? And the then... 8 o'clock Pacific <laughs> show, Vien Pomachan, eight minutes, rectal alien parasites. <laughs> And then, and then, uh, and then, when they come, people that were at that show are going to be like, "Wow, he was not telling jokes; he was predicting the future." <laughs> I'm going to take your silence as awe. Yeah, I'm not a comedian here. I'm a mentalist. I'm yeah, yeah. reading. Them. I'm an avant-garde comedian. I'm very edgy. Sometimes those jokes you won't even laugh about them ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like. Uh, 
Uh, I'm ahead of the curve. That's what's going on here. <laughs> yeah, like, you guys are just not, not as... smart enough to get my jokes. <laughs> As soon as the aliens come, then you'll be laughing. <laughs> or will I be the one laughing? <laughs> it might need a little time after. Even if that came true, I think we would need some time to laugh about the rectal alien parasites. Yeah, you got to always leave a little bit of a cushion in there. <laughs> yeah. it, it's already too soon. Yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. That's for sure. Might have to put that one in a time capsule for 10 years <laughs> after 2021. Oh, man. I wonder, that's actually a funny point you bring up there with time ca- capsules. Because I wonder if, a, you know, if comics, I guess I don't, and I never thought about it, but it, it is something where you could do that, write a joke that's about something that happened, but yeah. time capsule it just because of the, you know, the I, too soon or whatever. I think and that's just... <laughs> a, a lost understanding. Mm-hmm. I think comedy's gotten so competitive and people want to get a hot take out there so uh, quickly. Yeah, that's fair. That you're, you can joke about anything as long as it, it's not hurting anyone, you mm-hmm. know, like as long as people are healed from it. Yeah. So, but, but the edge, you know, the edge that, that we live on, everyone's wanting to get that joke out first because they're afraid they're going to lose it to somebody else. Yeah. But then you run the risk of just being a jerk. Oh, absolutely. You no, know, that's like, a good point, though. Like I heard Michael Che's special and where he talks about Hitler. Like there mm-hmm. was three Hitler jokes that came out this year. Like Norm MacDonald made a Hitler joke about how Hitler had a dog. And at the end of every day, he would come home and there was a dog that was loved him. Couldn't wait till Hitler was home. He's like, yay, Hitler's home. And even then, it was still a little hard, you know? Yeah. Like, yep. for, like I, I, I thought it was funny, but at the same time, I'm like, I, I was looking for permission to laugh still. Uh, and we're yep. talking about how many years has it been, okay? We're like yep. 50 years after, 50 plus years. And it's like, you know, he, he waited 50 years to tell that joke, you know? You don't need to tell your Kobe Bryant joke, you know, the day of. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but you, but yeah, like I said, you make a good point though that hot take thing because yeah, everybody's wants to get on Twitter or whatever social media platform get that joke out there. Yeah, yeah, which uh, can definitely be a mistake. I feel like I made a joke on Twitter yesterday uh, in a response to a governor. And it was a political thing, and man, did I make some people upset. <laughs> <laughs> I do not have a lot of conservative fans. <laughs> well, <laughs> you uh, you remember politics is one of the the you know fly very carefully places. Oh, absolutely. You know, you, you violated and, and invited <laughs> yeah. uh, scrutiny with that one. Yeah, I, oh, I definitely did, and yeah. and I was like, whatever, I don't care. I, I made the joke and I stand by it. It was funny to me because I think a lot of it went over people's head. They yeah. don't remember yeah. all the. They didn't. They didn't quite get all the contents of. Yeah. Uh, what it was about. But. So I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and yell at myself cuz I know so, there are people that are disagree with the whole time thing. We can say whatever we want. Oh yeah, yeah, free speech. Go ahead. I don't care. Yeah. I just learned about a new social uh media platform today yeah. called Polar or Pol- Parlor or is that what it's called? Parlor or Par I don't know how you Parlay? pronounce it. Parlay. Parlay, maybe that's it. Maybe yeah, that's what you say. Sense. It. But it's uh basically it's uh, from what I gathered, it's just a conservative social media platform. It was like they described it as Twitter for conservatives. So it's all these people that are getting mad that you know Facebook and Instagram and Twitter are are coming down on the spread of misinformation or you know things that are hurtful or whatever it may be. Basically, they think they're censoring their free speech. So mm. this is like a social media platform where they don't care about anything. I mean, I, I'm fine with that. I, I'm okay with it. <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I was just like, I didn't know it existed till today. It's been around for like two years. I okay. Like, I can't even <laughs> keep up with anything. So that's how I, I feel. I can't weigh in on it. I'll be like, you know, 17 years from now when I'm done. You know, I just discovered Radiohead. <laughs> so you know, you kids can tell me how parlay is and. When, you know, I'm still figuring out Twitter and hashtags and stuff. Yeah, I'm right there with you on that. So, so we're, I, we're about the, we're the same place on that. I'm, I'm at a place where I'm hoping some of this stuff goes away so I don't have to learn it. Yeah. That's anytime there's new social media, I, I'm just like, oh, no. 
another thing that I have to try to keep up on. <laughs> <laughs> Some of this stuff is exhausting. It is. Sometimes I feel like that's the worst part about being in entertainment. Is yeah. It's like a necessary evil. Like yeah. to be competitive, you've got to have social media. You got to be promoting yourself, marketing yourself. But at the same time, like you said, it gets real exhausting. Yeah, and the people that are good at it, like they flaunt it. Like they'll post something and be like, "You can also hear these same words on Twitter, Twitch, Switch, Swatch, Parlay." <laughs> and I'm like, "Are you just making up words? Are these all platforms?" Because I don't. Because right? I mean, I you don't have a day job, do you? You can't. You can't load. <laughs> The same, and I see you post twenty five times a day on seventeen platforms, and there's sixty seven hashtags. I mean, how much time do you do you spend hashtagging? Oh yeah, a lot. I got smart. Uh, like I've just decided unfriend you. <laughs> After like the tenth hashtag, yeah, you're it's like, like I don't want to be friends with someone who has this many hashtags. <laughs> I feel like you have a problem. Right. I actually, for my podcast, I got smart and I just put it in a note file so I could copy and paste. Yeah. You know the 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 hashtags I need when I do posts or whatever for that. But even that, like, I don't. I I'm just not keeping up as much as I could. But like I said, it's it gets exhausting, and especially with all the negativity out there. Yeah. Uh, do you have a writing process? Are you do you sit down and write? So much at a time? I or? do. You know, the the way I approach it is if I have material that's close, I'll perform and perform and perform. Mm -hmm. But then there's a point at which you have your material down and then you need more material. Um, I actually will shut myself down. Like for me, the performing is the reward yep. for for writing. And and you know, if you're if you're really enjoying the performing but you're not evolving it's keeping you away from the writing. So I actually will quarantine myself for periods of time to write material. And then I won't allow myself to perform until I have enough material that I feel is adequate, you know, oh, to, okay. to bring to an open mic. or And so it's just my way of, of keeping myself accountable. Um, if I find myself in a rut, you know, I, I write down concepts all the time, premises, everything that pops into my head. I have a, a list of, of more than I could ever write. And then what I'll do is I'll cycle through those concepts in my head, and I'll just speak them out loud. Um, I, I actually will do coaching. Like I have um, um, comedy coaches that various schools, various classes, and I do them. And I know people have mixed feelings about them. But yeah. for me, it's just if I invest in it, if I put money into it, it forces me to make value from it. It, mm -hmm. It's skin in the game. Oh, absolutely. And and it sets a time for me to write. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll set aside. Every day I spend at least an hour. It's My commitment is one hour a day. And I'll either review comedy. I'll either watch comedy. I'll either go over my sets. I'll write new material. Or I'll perform. Um, but it's not – it's not more than that. Like if it's more than that and you're forcing it, then it's, it'll end up being garbage or you burn yourself out. So for me, if, I, if I'm burned out on performing or I feel like I'm going through the motions or stale, step away from the stage. I'll write you know, for an hour a day, try to get five minutes out of it, spend a couple of weeks doing that, then hit the stage hard, throw that new material into a, into a, to a set, and then – kind of refine it mm -hmm. so you, it's like sticking a new iron in the fire you no know? absolutely no so. that's actually that's a good way to do it you know because then it, it also gives you time to refresh mm -hmm. you know with having uh taking that time because you even because you could be writing new stuff and then performing old stuff and and when you're doing it all together it's just you know and sometimes with older material it just becomes like you're just going to autopilot mm -hmm. it's not as fun to perform anymore mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and yeah i don't know that's one thing that's always i've always thought was kind of funny with comedy and i've talked about it before on this podcast concerning comedy classes because it's like anything else that you try to do in life you know that if you want to have any career in anything you really technically most things have to go to school yeah. and learn how yeah. to do that. Yeah. And with comedy, people are like, oh, the only way to get good at comedy is just do it. And I'm like, <laughs> that's not necessarily true. I mean, you can get something. I mean, you learning, if you want to know about something, learning is the best way. And the best way is to study it, whether it be, you know, and part of studying it is going on stage, obviously, and yeah. doing comedy. Yeah. That's part of the whole 
learning, you know, learning curve of it. But I feel like people can get something from classes. I mean, I haven't really taken a lot of stand-up classes because when I started, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. And, and but I've definitely, you know, I've taken like improv classes and writing classes and other, you know, acting classes, other things that will help with stand-up. But I don't know. I always find it funny that there's such yeah. a negative connotation well, about that. Comedy is unique because it, it, it is a combination of a skill and an art. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's its own thing, okay? It's not purely an art. It's not purely a skill. There's a skill to comedy. There's a method to comedy. There's yep. concepts and philosophies behind it. And the people who originated a comedy figured it out. They, they figured it out and they recognized the pattern and then other people put it into books. And you can figure it out by doing it, yep. okay? Or you can figure it out by reading about it and then doing it, yep. you know, and skip a few steps, right? Yep. Like I could probably light wood on fire by rubbing sticks together, okay? I could. But someone has pioneered the way to, like, make that wood catch on fire using a lighter, and so I don't feel the need to go back and, and, <laughs> and, and, and chop down trees with, like, uh, s- stones. So I have I personally think that, that there's always something to learn. And, you know, you can learn it yourself or you can learn it through other people. Mm-hmm. I, I like to cheat. You know, if someone has figured something out and he could give me the answer, why wouldn't I take the answer? Oh, you know? absolutely. Oh, so, absolutely. So, I mean, I'm okay with people languishing, but... Yeah. I, th- I think it's. I think there's something to be gained from classes and books and that sort of thing. I'm a big nerd. I uh, I didn't come from comedy. I'm. A, I mean, I'm, I'm. I'm a physician in real life, so I'm a yeah. little bit biased towards the learning process. Now, your doctor could figure out by you know kidnapping and slicing people open how to be a surgeon, or <laughs> he could go to medical school. You know, that's an option too. <laughs> Ain't that a scary, scary thought? You're absolutely right. They could learn that way. Yeah. Oh, man. No, that, but I also like what you said, too, though, with, you know, when you put, and I feel this way, too, when I put money into something, then I'm vested. Yeah. And I, you know, I want to get something out of it. Yeah. Because, you know, because you don't want to just waste the money. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you definitely, definitely put yourself up to where you have to, like, get something out of it and try. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, you waste it's that money. It's easy but to waste time. It's it's harder to waste money. Absolutely, especially, what, especially in a, if it's in both in indus- industry like this. Yeah, you know. But I do get. I I, I understand why some people, you know, because there are a lot of like comedy classes that are pretty pretty shady. Agreed. Agreed. But, I'm not going to say they're all good. No, but and, I, and not everyone's going to learn from that environment. So no. I respect people who want to tell jokes right away. Yep. And say whatever's on their mind. I also respect people who who believe in just crafting it on the fly and not being hindered by anyone's discipline. There's tons of garbage, cash grab, you know, classes out there. Don't be careful how you do it. Um, yeah. I've benefited from them. I think there's benefit in them. Mm-hmm. Just, you know, budget yep. your, whether you can afford it and, and see if you would gain anything. So, I mean, there are people that just don't learn in that environment, period. Yeah. And, and of course, you guys have to naturally select for yourselves. Yeah. Well, and I think that's that's what's key, too, there is that it, doing the research. And, you know, if you want to take a comedy class, research and pick the comedy class that you think would be best for you. Don't just go with the, the first guy that's offering to teach you how to do anything, for that matter. Because I'm like you, too. Like, I'm all about learning. But I'm more of a self-learner. And not where I'm like, oh, i got to go up and I just – I read a lot of books. You know, if I want to learn about something, I'm like, let's go. What What are the books on this? Read these books and then, you know – try to get better at it, whether it be yeah. taking a class or doing it or whatever. Yeah, I agree. Um, as far as uh, writing, uh, as far as what your material comes from, you said you, you do more personal stuff typically. Is that how you kind of develop material, just try to? Yeah, it's all, it's, all, it's all written for me. It's all stuff that I see and hear and, and live. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it's, I, I, don't, I don't try to write a joke. I just write down something funny that's happened to me and then I deliver it to the audience. I mean, we funny stuff happens to everybody every day. Yep, you know, absolutely. you laugh every single day. And it's just whether you can craft that experience into a joke that's mm-hmm. deliverable, that's publishable. So, you know, I I have sort of an odd upbringing. You know, I'm 
I'm an immigrant. Uh, I have a, our culture is very different from from the culture that we live in, and so that's comedic gold, mm-hmm. you know. When when you have like the perfect strangers phenomenon in your life every day, and uh, you know, the funny stuff happens to me as a physician. You know, patients are weird and funny. Oh, I'm sure. And so <laughs> that's all that's all free material, you yeah. know. And I think I think you're you're given your material. You're inspired. You know you. I, I don't. I, I don't know that I know anyone who just sits down and creates material, you know, from thin air. You yeah. know, a funny concept that they whip into shape. It's always just something goofy that happens that yeah. that we just transcribe. We're transcriptionists mm-hmm. and storytellers. No, nope, absolutely. That's. Uh, I don't know. Some people, uh, and props to them that they can do it. I know there's some comics that can just sit there and write jokes that have nothing to do with like personal mm-hmm. experience. You know, well, Jerry Seinfeld not, comes and, to mind. I, and it's like props to them, but I can't do that. Like, like, like you, most of my stuff comes from funny things that have happened mm-hmm. or experiences or observations or whatever it might be. Um, do you have a pre-show tradition or ritual? Yes, I uh, go over my set obsessively. <laughs> I, I, I have like I'm, you know, my biggest fear is is reliving that bombing experience <laughs> and blanking on stage and forgetting my material. So. I actually will write out my set word for word, um, you know, in a spoken voice. Uh, mm-hmm. And then I have cards, you know, that remember the colored index cards. You would think I was Bill Belichick. Do you do you, so? How do you organize your colored cards? My colored cards. Well, I mean, they're they're topic. They're 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 okay, chunks. Okay, you do it by. Topic. So if okay. I have a bunch of chunks about medical stuff, they'll all be the same color, you know. Okay, yep. And then I'll just write one word to remind me. And then I, I record my sets, and then sometimes if I'm really OCD, I'll actually video edit my set and put the jokes in order as they've been performed. That way I can listen to them in the car. Oh, wow. So when I'm driving, if I have to do 25 minutes, I'll, I'll take a recent 25-minute feature set. I'll edit out you know, a, a joke that I'm not using this set. I'll edit in another joke that I'm planning on using. Oh, okay. And I then, gotcha. And then that's a way for me to actually hear my set perform. Like it's like, Wow, that's a really – Good idea. That's I, an interesting. Can we cut way. that out of the podcast? Yeah, you don't, don't want other people to know people your, your secret because that. that's actually that's really good. Doing you know cutting in and out of the jokes, so yeah. then you can just listen to the set. Yeah, hmm. it's interesting. I'm too lazy to do that. Well, that's because that does that's, that's a lot of process. It's actually a lot of work. It is a lot of because video editing is a lot of work. Yeah, that's for sure. The last thing I like to do, I like to end with positive stuff. Yeah, and I like to talk about uh, best shows. You you may have already talked about it you talked about you know when you first started that was one of your best shows but what comes to mind for best best show i mean i had a recent feature uh, and it was i wasn't even supposed to be on the show it was one of those where i was picked to be a last minute feature oh nice and uh you know club just it was sort of an added show Mm -hmm. club said go crazy you know and i'd been featuring there um, but this, this was sort of, it kind of became my show and, and I, I, I did all the stuff that, that I did well. And then I added probably 10 new minutes, you know, but I did it in a way that was safe, you know, peppered it in. And then I got about, you know, probably 28 of the best minutes, uh, uh that I've ever done. So a couple jokes fell flat. I did push it a little bit. I probably could have trimmed one or two jokes out of that set, but, but that's probably been my, and that was just probably a month ago that nice. that happened. So that's good. On yeah. a hot streak. Another yeah. one of them hot streaks. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, go until, ahead. until I do my eight new minutes on Wednesday on <laughs> the rectal alien parasites, as long as you wait till, <laughs> wait till Wednesday, right? <laughs> that's how I'm going to end my hot streak. <laughs> is that, that, that show, is that back home or is that here? The home club oh, that's La- the home laughing club. in Fort Myers. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right. What, what happens if you would, advance tonight i don't know i do the next show after that oh yeah but that could be tuesday or wednesday i'm i'm on the wednesday show i'm actually i'm here early oh you're I'm, on the wednesday show i'm on the wednesday show oh you're talking about this contest yeah oh i thought you were for some reason i had it in my head you were performing tonight no no That's, no no oh okay i'm in the wednesday show this oh week. never mind i'm dumb and didn't <laughs> put thoughts together <laughs> <laughs> Okay, now that I'm there. Okay, now I get it. All right. <laughs> I look forward to those eight new minutes. <laughs> Where can people find you? Uh, uh, speak. Comic Doc, C-O-M-I-C-D-O-C dot com is my website. All my social media and stuff are listed on there. All my events, all my shows, my bio, comicdoc.com. 
Nice. That's a that's a great website. Thank you. Um, I am surprised it was available, actually. Yeah, I, I am, too. I I'm was like, expecting wow, that's maybe pretty good. Comic Doc 96, you know. <laughs> but I guess they're... Kind of throw in a number or something. I, I thought... <laughs> I, I guess there aren't that many doctors in comedy. Oh, maybe not. It's huh? like me and Ken Jong. <laughs> yeah, well, hey. So I thought I'd be Comic Doc 2. <laughs> at least. But he's really too dumb to get the domain. Yeah. Actually, that to me, when, when you first said that, to me, that sounds like somebody that is like uh, like a comic mentor. You know, like Comic Doc. So it's like somebody that helps people fix yeah, their comedy. Yeah, we're going to start a club. <laughs> there we go. He's a pioneer. He's opened the door for a wave of Asian <laughs> comedian doctors. And we're going to find that there was this groundswell of them that has been neglected this whole time. We just needed a voice. You know, and the next thing, it's just nothing but comedy doctors everywhere. The time is now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This was a blast. The Art of Bombing is a Blitzed Entertainment production. Hosted and produced by Dan Bublitz Jr., the Art of Bombing intro music was written and performed by John Holt. All other music used in this podcast was under the Creative Commons license. If you would like to help the Art of Bombing, you can do so by subscribing, rating, and reviewing our show on whatever podcast application you use to listen to the Art of Bombing. For previous episodes, blogs, and more, visit artofbombingpod.com. Have a great week. And remember, stay safe so you can live to love.